Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight. My name is Richard, and I'm part of the National Executive Board for Sling Health. I have some of my other colleagues and teammates here with me tonight. Um, they've helped me spun, spin this event up pretty quickly. Uh, so we're excited to present some of our work from our Sling Health teams uh, here tonight. They've worked very hard to put these together despite the um, pandemic, frankly, that's uh, happening in, in the world right now. Uh, in addition to these pitches, some of the teams have put together also posters that's uh, being showcased on our website right now. So when you have a chance and have some time, be sure to visit slinghealth.org slash demo day. And before we go into the presentations themselves, I do, I'll do them team by team. Uh, we're going to use maybe the first 10 minutes or so to make a couple of announcements about our sponsors, uh, the boot camp that we'll be hosting in a few weeks here, our judges and a feedback form that you'll see me reference uh, throughout the next hour for, for the event. Um, so to kick off, uh, just a quick word about our organization from the president of Sling Health. He's also a med student from Harvard, uh, Mario Russo. So we'll hear a quick word from him and then we'll uh, jump into some of those announcements that I was saying. Good evening, everyone. I hope you, you and your families are all well and safe. My name is Mario Russo, and I'm the president of Sling Health. Sling Health is a national network of biotechnology accelerators centered in major cities and large universities around the country that aims to impact medicine while training the future of innovators. And especially in times like these, there has been no greater need for innovators primed to make a difference in healthcare than now. And so thank you for joining us in the setting of COVID for the showcase of our budding student-led companies from across our network. Tonight, you'll be able to see what our students have accomplished over the course of the past year, even through quarantine. And we do encourage you to get in touch with the teams for further conversations. If you're interested or find you can make an impact on their companies. Before we showcase the teams, I want to do a brief introduction into Sling Health and our national program. Like I mentioned, Sling Health not only trains students to innovate, but is also run by student leaders from across the country. I myself am a medical student studying at Harvard and graduated with a degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan. And you'll find similar stories to mine across the board uh, from our leaders. All of us are brought together by a passion to make an impact in medicine. Sling Health is founded on solving this problem. A disconnect between students who have the skills and drive to solve problems, but don't have the exposure to the clinical setting and medical professionals that witness and grapple these problems, but don't have the time or technical expertise to solve them. Sling Health bridges this gap by engaging with and collecting pressing clinical problems from medical professionals and providing teams of students the resources and training necessary to form lasting solutions. Our program runs with the school year and in a typical year, usually capstones in our national demo day competition. Our experiential platform facilitates the formation of student teams around those pressing clinical problems before leading them through the entire innovation process. Throughout their development, we make sure to have our teams engage with key stakeholders to hone the solutions. And we also have checkpoints or design reviews with entrepreneurs and experts to gather the feedback they need to accelerate forward. By the end of the year, many of our teams are ready to push forward with their startups. Here you can see pictures from our previous national demo days. And this is just a selection of over 20 startups that we've spun out, all started by students that have raised over $18 million in investments. And this, like I said, is possible because of the efforts pushed by student leaders at chapters around the country. So if you'd like to get involved, mentor, partner, or think a Sling Health chapter should be brought to your local institution, please email me at the following email on this slide. And like I said, please feel free to get in touch with the teams following tonight's showcase. Um, you can see on this slide that there is a QR code that we'll be showcasing um, throughout the presentations tonight. You can just scan that and you'll be led to a form to help get in contact with these students. And with that said, there's nothing left to do but to show you what some of our top teams have developed this year. I'd like to congratulate them all on a great year of hard work and I'd like to thank all of you for your time tonight. Thank you. All right, so that was just a quick word from uh, the president of Sling Health, uh, Mario. Again, thank you for um, putting that together. Um, before we formally begin, just a few, a couple of announcements here tonight, everybody. 
Um, wanted to reiterate that because of the uh, COVID situation, students were sent home across the country, uh, which impacted much of the progress that they had wanted to achieve during the summer. Uh, but in spite of this, they were able to do so much and uh, we were able to make some adjustments last minute to showcase our teams here tonight um, in a new way and we hope you enjoy. Of course, this wouldn't have been possible without some of our sponsors. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, all our sponsors here on, on this particular slide, uh, the different schools at the Washington University in St. Louis, I-10, Hush Blackwell, the Healthcare Innovation Lab at uh, BJC Healthcare, BioGenerator, Cortex, the Innovation Community, Shalom, uh, E4B and SCORE, as well as uh, SCO Partnership. we we'll also like to thank our judges. Uh, they were generous enough to give us some of their time to uh, provide feedback to teams as well as come to a uh, final consensus on to the one, two, and three uh, that we're going to announce later tonight. So a special thank you to uh, Emery, uh, Kaushik, and Jack for giving us their, their schedules. And this was the boot camp that we had referenced earlier. Again, this is uh, a month long event, very hands off, that we're going to begin in the middle of May, just a few weeks away from now. We're recruiting mentors uh, to help students and then also students themselves to actually participate in the event. So if you're interested, uh, we could send this newsletter out to you or you could visit slinghealth.org. And then finally, you saw this uh, in Mario's presentation, but this is a QR code and link that I would show uh, throughout the night tonight as new audience members come in. It directs you to a feedback form where you can ask questions and provide feedback as the teams tonight continue refining their products and, and ideas. Uh, Sling Health is truly a collaborative community, so we always encourage these types of activities. Um, I would show this about every two or so teams, uh, so feel free to grab your phone and uh, just QR it, or you could go to that link to uh, provide feedback and again, ask questions. Okay. So without further ado, I want to present uh, team number one, Epi Surveil. Um, it's our team out of St. Louis. Hello, my name is Ben Davidorf and I represent Episurveil. We are a company that is developing a next generation seizure detection system. The problem that we're trying to address is SUDEP, which stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. As the name suggests, SUDEP is a condition where one in a thousand patients with epilepsy die unexpectedly and at the time of autopsy, no cause of death can be found. It is the leading cause of death in patients with uncontrolled epilepsy. It occurs most often at night after tonic-clonic seizures, which have a significant gross movement components. And supervision has been associated with a decreased risk of death. So let me paint a picture for you. You're a parent of a child with epilepsy. You tuck your child in bed, you read them their favorite bedtime story, and then you kiss them goodnight. It is at this point that the story can go in one of three ways. In the first scenario, you go to wake up your child the next day only to find him or her laying in dead in bed. This may seem like a scene from a horror movie. However, this is the reality for far too many caregivers of children who succumb to SUDEP. In the second scenario, the parent buys a device for detecting seizures with the idea that they could administer seizure first aid to prevent SUDEP in their child. Unfortunately, most seizure detection devices on the market have a high false positive rate. So the parent spends most of their night sleeplessly responding to false alarm after false alarm and eventually getting caregiver fatigue. I would like to put forth the vision of the third scenario where the parent uses a next generation seizure detection device, which can detect seizures with high accuracy without waking up the caregiver unnecessarily, thus allowing the child and the parent to have a full night of health restoring sleep. 
There are about 50 million people worldwide living with epilepsy. Driven by drugs for epilepsy, the market for it is roughly $5.4 billion. Because of the shortage of good devices, the market for seizure detection devices is considerably smaller at $9 million. However, with the advent of new technology, the seizure detection market is expected to grow to be $25 million by 2024. There are several devices in the competitive landscape. Here we I can't hear. I'm not sure if it's just me. Yeah, Richard, the audio might have fit out. You there, Richard? Looks like it's completely frozen, actually. Let's see if I can call him. Hey everybody, I've just been informed that our audio just went down, so I am deeply sorry about that. Uh, let me just take a quick minute to figure out what's going on and then resume as quickly as possible. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Okay, let's go ahead and try and resume. I do apologize for the uh, brief detour there, but we should be okay now. That we were able to achieve an accuracy of greater than 75% on a separate test set, which with such little training data. With more high quality data, we expect the value to increase significantly. For our current revenue, we plan to participate in several pitch competitions. For future revenue, we plan to partner with hospitals to get customers once we have a finished product. We would competitively price the device at $500. This would provide a gross profit of $200 per unit sold after accounting for material costs. For our current milestone, we have made a model that can detect seizures with greater than 75% accuracy using low quality videos obtained from YouTube. The next step would be to get IRB approval at WashU so that we can get access to thousands of high quality seizure videos. These videos will be essential for improving the accuracy to near 100% while keeping the false positive rate low. We are also in the process of patenting our seizure detection system. Once we have a working deep learning model, we will incorporate the model into a device controlled by a microcontroller. Finally, we will introduce our product to the market. In the next year, we'll finalize our product. By the end of year three, we plan to obtain FDA approval so that we can have insurance pay for the device. By year four, we plan to capture 10% of the seizure detection market. 
which would value the company near a million dollars. In year five, we plan to be bought out by a larger company like Google Health. The Episurveil team has the expertise to bring the seizure detection device to market. Our CEO is Anima Orikari, who is an MD PhD student at WashU. Our chief techno technical officer is me, Ben David Orff, who is a sophomore biomedical engineer and healthcare management minor at WashU. Our chief operations officer is Toshi Cousins, who is a junior biomedical engineering student at WashU. Finally, our chief science officer is Sumeya Motion who is a junior bi biology student at St. Louis University. Currently, our advisory board consists of Dr. John Zempel, who is a trained pediatric epileptologist, and Dr. John, uh, Dr. Joseph Kleisner, who is a biomedical engineer. They will give us the guidance to take our device to market. Thank you for your attention and stay safe and stay healthy. Okay, so that was our first team Epi Serval. Um, I will just be going into our second team now, Eurogix, which is our, again based out of uh, St. Louis, and they are hoping to develop a cost-effective treatment for uh, prostate enlargement that avoids complications and is more available to patients. So this is Eurogix. Hi, my name is Kevin Park, and I'm co-leading Eurogix with Raphael Chong and we're working on providing immediate relief of BPH symptoms. So BPH or prostate enlargement is non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. And the enlarged prostate blocks the urethra where the urine flows. BPH affects 50% of men over 50 and significantly decreases their quality of life. Typical BPH symptoms include frequent urination, urgency, and difficulty starting urination. In addition, prolonged BPH symptoms can cause bladder or kidney damage. There are 500 million men with BPH symptoms worldwide and will be in the BPH surgical device market, which is around $3.2 billion. And based on the patient's eligibility for our device and the competition, uh, we estimate our serviceable obtainable market to be around $194 million. So first-line treatment is medications such as Flomax or Avidart. These prescription drugs are highly accessible. However, they only work temporarily and for mild BPH symptoms. TURP, which is surgical resection of the prostate, is considered the gold standard. It is efficient in reducing prostate volume, but it causes inefficient coagulation, intraoperative bleeding, and complications after the procedures. Urolift is the most recent implant solution that compresses enlarged prostate gland. However, this procedure is very expensive and does not work for prostate volume over 80 grams. We're working on a device that is cost effective and causes less complication than current solutions. Our solution is a super elastic nitrile implant that can be folded and inserted at the tip of the delivery device. And with the push of a wire, the implant is pushed out and it returns to its original shape. And in doing so, it will exert force on the prosthetic tissue. This will be a transurethral approach, and our design is patent pending. Here is a mechanism of action for our procedure. Preoperatively, the enlarged prostate is obstructing urine flow. To deploy the implant, a delivery device will be introduced through the urethra. Postoperatively, the implant mechanically dilates the urethra and allows more comfortable urination. Here are our prototypes at 5x scale. In the top left corner, you can see the implant in its original open shape. In the middle, you see our delivery device. And in the lower right corner, the implant is folded and inserted at the tip of the delivery device. Here is a video of our simulated procedure using a prostate model. But right now, we are inserting the delivery device through the urethra until we reach the bladder space. Now, once at the bladder, the delivery device is uh, pulled back about 1.5 centimeters to make sure the implant is clear of the bladder when it's deployed. When the delivery device is at the right place, we lift up the delivery device 
to make sure there's a secure contact between the arch of the implant and the prostate tissue. Now with the push of a wire, the implant is pushed out of the delivery device and deployed in the prostate urethra. And as you can see, the implant was successfully deployed and successfully dilates the prostate urethra, allowing urine flow. Since our procedure preserves the natural anatomy of the prostate, it will reduce complications related to our procedure. And also since one implant can exert force on both sides of the prostate, we can decrease the number of implants required and therefore the cost of the procedure. Here are our beta prototypes at the 1x scale. We used an actual Foley catheter with a diameter of 5.3 millimeters. And our nitinol implant had a width of about 12 millimeters. The benchtop testing shows a dilation of the obstructed urethral channel. Our future directions include performing cadaver experiments with our 1x scale prototype. We'll be performing additional testings for our prototype, as well as animal model testing by the end of the year. Throughout this process, we'll be talking with urologists to validate our design. One of the barriers to entry for medical devices is the physician's reluctance to deviate from proven practice methods. Talking with more urologists and making sure that our design meets their needs will help us convince them to learn more about our procedure. Other barriers to entry include intellectual property, FDA regulation, and reimbursement. To address these barriers, we'll be filing a non-provisional patent for our design. We'll apply for investigational device exemption to perform clinical trials, and we expect our device to be a class two device, so we'll use the 510K pathway with Eurolift as a predicate device. We also identified some potential CPT codes for reimbursement. We are a team of engineering students and medical students. Kevin and I are in the Biomedical Innovation Program with experience in medical device product development. The medical students provide us with the clinical knowledge and resources, while the engineering students bring biomaterials knowledge and computational modeling techniques. We'd like to thank Dr. Eric, our clinical advisor, for all his feedback on our design, and also Mr. Steven Von Rump at I-10 for his business insights, and Hush Blackwell for the legal advice. Thank you for your time. Okay, everybody, so that was Eurogix, uh, our second team. And before we go into our next set here, again, I just wanted to flash this uh, QR code and link very quickly for uh, any audience members that have joined us just a little bit late here tonight. Um, I apologize for the technical and audio issues uh, before again, uh, but for this link and QR code, it directs to a form where you can ask these teams uh, questions and provide feedback as they uh, continue to refine their ideas and, and prototypes. So I'll just give uh, a few seconds here before we jump into our third team. Okay. So moving on to our third team, it is Olera, based out of Texas, a digital platform for dementia care. Hello, everyone. My name is Logan Duper, and I'm a third-year medical student here at Texas a and I'm honored and excited to present Olera, a novel mobile phone application that focuses on connecting our elderly population with professional assistance. And our group members prepared this presentation with the hopes to give our audience an introduction to our idea for Olera Care. Number one, we'd like to focus on the problems that the elderly and their families face. Second, we'd like to show how Alera Care solves these problems. Thirdly, we'd like to show our design progress to date. We'd also like to talk about our business model and lastly, our future plans. If you or a loved one has ever been in a situation with professional health, elderly care, you may be able to attest the multitude of different options that are currently in the market. Freelance caregivers are available, established companies offering in home. Assistance, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, assisted living homes, retirement communities. The sheer volume of these options is enough to overwhelm a family member, let alone the fact that this population in the market is dealing with things like declining mobility, increased cognitive functioning. All of this is very stressful, full of endless phone calls to various providers and time consuming internet searches. To address this problem, we are developing a mobile application to assist the family members of seniors in need of care. This application makes local care options, such as caregivers and elderly care facilities, 
readily accessible. In addition, the app is also capable of providing recommendation based on the user's needs. Finally, this app features a simple, clean, modern design, which standardizes the process of finding care. So let's just dive right in. Upon signing into the app, we're presented with this interface with a few things going on. Firstly, we can see the facilities that are close to us, as well as the reviews in a short description. The same can be said for the caregivers who have also posted onto the app. And we also have some more information regarding services. Once we click into the facilities, we have more uh, details, their location, as well as access to their websites and uh, capability to call them directly through the app. We can get even more granular by seeing more images of the facilities, their daily rates, prices, location. This is information that you would otherwise have to spend hours looking for. By having all this information on the app, we're saving our users tons of time. You know, you can easily compare in, in a matter of seconds. The same can be done with the caregivers. You can see their information as well as their certification and prior experiences. Again, we can have more information about the caregivers, their location, their prices, um, and how they compare to the competition. This is, this is another way just to save a lot of time or reduce the friction of finding care. We can filter the caregivers as well as the facilities by their price, availability, type of care, location, things you would expect. And that's just a quick tour of the app. We'd like to offer some data to help put into perspective the scope of the elderly care market. Dementia in and of itself is the sixth leading cause of death in the US. And 5.7 million Americans suffer from it. This costs a total of $260 billion to the US alone in 2017. That 5.7 million Americans equates to roughly one out of 10 Americans 65 years or older, with an average out of pocket annual cost $61,522. However, the most striking that we have to offer as evidence of dire need for attention to the elderly care market is that 70% of people ages 65 or older will at some point in time require a form of long-term special care. The elderly care team values more than anything the customer and their needs. Through many customer interviews over this last year, we've distilled down the top pain points that the elderly population faces. Number one, there's such a high cost associated with Number two, the time spent sorting through all the various options locally available is consuming and overwhelming. Number three, the shifting in what assistance an elderly person needs today compared to months or even years later leads to a constant entry and re-entry into this confusing and overwhelming market of professional assistance. So our team has conducted a thorough analysis of the competitive landscape, and these are the top players in that space. A place for mom, care.com, and CareLinks. Of all of these services, none of them offer that unique combination of facilities and caregivers within one platform. Another reason we stand out is our focus on dementia care, which doesn't exist with our competitors. And finally, since these conditions tend to worsen over time, we provide smart recommendations, which ease the so-called continuum of care. So how do we make money? Well, we have two streams of revenue. The first is by charging care providers to market on our app. Most of these nursing homes and assisted living facilities are for-profit, privately owned institutions and are looking for ways to market their services. And we can offer this capability for a price. The second way we will generate revenue is by collecting a service fee for caregivers who are booked through the app similar to how Uber takes a slice of the commission for ride shares. But of course, our services will always be free for those looking for care. Dementia is difficult enough. Moving forward, Alara is going to gather input on the prototype from real family members presence as one of the top senior care services. By reaching out to family members in these early stages of development, Alara begins to establish its customer base before it even releases the final versions of the application. The Alara team seeks to deliver a valuable product that will realistically change lives for the better. Okay, so that was our third team. I'm gonna exit out of the screen here and go ahead and introduce our fourth team. So our fourth team is uh, TerraHub, based out of New Orleans, is a telemedical platform for allowing physicians to monitor and adjust uh, 
patient therapeutics. Hello there. My name is Jake Dwaran, and I'm accompanied by Shreya Gunda and John Johnson, and we're a group of LC Medical School students who have the pleasure of telling you about our creation, Verahub Integration Services. So without further ado, I'm going to let Shreya take over. Imagine you are a clinician working in this rehabilitation clinic. With the tedious documentation of electronic health records and other administrative duties, the phone calls and all of your other tasks, you find that you cannot spend enough time with your patients or even schedule them all in. You wouldn't be alone. Time that physicians spend on administrative tasks has been increasing dramatically in the last decade. 70% of physicians now spend over 10 hours per week on paperwork and administrative tasks. 89% of physicians spend less than 25 minutes with their patients, and 66% spend less than 16 minutes with their patients. You also find that most of your patients aren't adhering to their treatment plan. You wouldn't be alone. Only 35% of physical therapy, 38% of speech therapy, and 40% of psychotherapy patients fully adhere to their plans of care. So you read the literature and see that VR games have been developed that are clinically beneficial as well as increased patient adherence to therapy, and that these games are now being developed for strokes, autism, Alzheimer's, PTSD, and Parkinson's. These are the amount of current cases in the United States. These are the number of new cases added per year. This is how much therapy costs per patient. So as you can see, with, an, with over 18 million current cases and roughly 1 million cases added each year, VR therapy is part of a nearly $300 billion industry that only stands to grow. This is your typical rehabilitation center, but with VR, your patient could be having fun while playing games like soccer or even be in more realistic situations like grocery shopping. The possibilities are endless and each plan can be tailor-made to the patient. So this astute physician thinks that they've solved the problem of their non-compliant patients. However, they're soon gonna be faced with another problem. So let's consider a typical physician-patient relationship. And let's say that this patient has a memory deficit and this patient is currently not adhering to the current therapeutic regimen recommended by the physician. So the physician starts researching into the wonderful world of virtual reality. It finds a game that's aimed at remedying the memory deficit. The patient really enjoys playing the game and the physician is getting all of the data, being how well the patient is doing, their progress, and a physician accessible platform to which the physician can then monitor how well the patient is doing as well as adjust the game so that way the patient is constantly being challenged and constantly progressing. Seems simple enough, right? Well, this isn't exactly realistic because a physician is tasked with caring for more than one patient, and each of these patients might have different deficits. For instance, let's say that patient one has a speech deficit, patient two a memory deficit, and patient three a logic deficit. This in the world of virtual reality means that three different virtual reality games are going to be required, to which all of them are going to require their own platform that the physician is going to need to be able to monitor the patients through. But let's add to the complexity a little bit more. Because the physician isn't typically tasked with just caring for three patients. They're tasked with caring for potentially many more patients. And of this patient population, let's say half of them have a memory deficit. Well, if the physician only provides one VR game for memory, all of those patients are going to respond the same to that one game, which means that the physician is going to have to start providing many more memory games. Likewise, the same for speech games, logic games, and any other types of games the physician chooses to employ. All these games are going to require their own platform to which the physician is responsible for being able to access to monitor the patients appropriately. You can see how this is starting to become more and more impractical because each of these platforms is going to have its own login, its own interface, and its own software, which starts to get a little bit cumbersome for the physician to deal with. Us as a group started to realize that this problem would occur and thought, how are we going to fix this? And our solution was, what if we take away the individual platforms? And that is the essence of Therahub, where we are a telemedical platform allowing for physician monitoring and adjustment of multiple patients' unique therapeutic gaming experiences. So you may be asking yourself, what exactly is Therahub offering here? Which of the gaming companies were offering a faster telemedical capability? 
The beauty of virtual reality as a therapeutic approach is that the patient can take it home with them. They don't necessarily need to be in a rehabilitation clinic or under immediate physician supervision to progress their therapy. Along with this, we're offering a seamless onboard process, which means that we're providing these gaming companies with the software for them to be easily and efficiently incorporated into TheraHub's database. And lastly, if a gamer was to sign on with TheraHub, then they would be immediately available to all of our subscribers, which means that this game is going to be exposed to a much more expansive network than if they were to try to do this alone. For the physicians, we're offering a subscription-based service to which offers an unlimited library of therapeutic games, which sets us apart from every other company out there. Because there are some companies that offer one game, some companies that may offer multiple games, but at TheraHub, we're looking to constantly update and include any games that have proven clinical benefit, which will include new and improved games that will outdate the previously made games, as well as new games that address new pathologies. And lastly, we're going to operate similar to any other platform in that we allow the physician to constantly monitor patient progress and adjust the patient's gameplay so that way they are constantly progressing. So in summary, we're a team of LSU medical school students looking for investors and collaborators to help us improve patient adherence to prescribed therapy and optimize patient experience and progress through the use of virtual reality in a way that prioritizes physician time because we offer an approach that involves only one platform instead of multiple to over 18 million patients and counting. With that, I'd like to thank you all for listening to this pitch and I wish you all well. Thank you. Okay, so that was our fourth team, uh, TheraHub. For the sake of time, we are just behind by a few minutes. So I know I had mentioned at the very beginning uh, of this event that I was going to show a LinkedIn uh, form that would direct to a place of feedback and questions for teams, but we're just gonna skip over those for now and get to the end where I'll flash it one last time. So wanna thank everybody for staying patient with us. Uh, we're just gonna go straight to our fifth team now, uh, Carolist. Carolist is also based out of St. Louis and they aim to help patients um, find doctors who understand their humanity alongside their pathology. Hi, my name is Matt, and today I'm here to talk to you about Carolist. We're helping patients find the right doctors for them based on identity factors, personal characteristics, and communication styles. Finding the right doctor can be really challenging. You might spend a long time on the phone with different doctor's offices trying to see who takes your insurance, who has an appointment. And you don't really know of anything about them until you walk into that office. Maybe you won't get along with them. If you're more tech savvy, you might go on Google and search for doctors in my area, and they'll give you this long list of different doctors to scroll through with one to five star reviews. But what does a five star review even mean? A five star doctor for me might be a one star doctor for you. This is especially an issue if you're part of a marginalized community. For example, if you're obese, or you're LGBTQ+. You might worry that the doctor is going to shame you for who you are, and you won't have a good relationship with them. This is also an extensive problem. If you don't have a good relationship with your doctor, you might not listen to what they tell you to do. You might not take your meds or do the right preventative care. You might not see them as often as you would want. This is known as non-adherence, and the cost of this can range from $5,200 to $52,000 per patient. Also, if you're not happy with your doctor, you might just leave. And that could be a big problem for insurance companies, healthcare systems, and private practices. It's a lot more cost effective to just keep the patient with the same doctor. My name is Matt. I'm a medical student at WashU. I studied bioinformatics and computer science at Stanford before. My teammates are Havisha, who's studying biology and healthcare management at WashU, Owen, who's studying computer science and business at WashU, and Moataz, who's a PharmD MBA student. Our diverse team has strengths in developing new prototypes, reaching out to our communities and finding new customers, developing business plans, and financial mapping. To better understand this problem, we ran a market validation survey of hundreds of patients across the United States. We found that 43% of people had trouble finding a new primary care provider in the past several years, and 40% of them were also uncomfortable discussing certain topics with their current doctor. But 80% of people 
would feel comfortable discussing those sensitive topics with the right doctor. So we knew we had the right problem to solve. So we built a prototype. So if you're a patient and you want to find a new doctor, we'll ask you what identity factors you think are important in your care and how you like your doctor to communicate. For your example, if you're obese and you think that affects your care, you can say weight is an important factor in your care and will help you find doctors who are known for being compassionate with working with obese patients. Or if you want to find a blunt doctor, we'll help you find that as well. We'll ask doctors similar things about the kinds of patients they're known for treating well and how they like to communicate. Once a patient puts in all of this information, we'll compare it against our curated database of doctors with all this information, and we'll come up with a personalized selection of doctors just for you. And we'll also tell you why we think these doctors would be good for you and will get along with you. For example, if you're obese, again, we'll help you find doctors who are known in their community for working compassionately with obese patients. So we'll show you these doctors, you'll call them, you'll set up an appointment, hopefully, and then you can come back and tell us how that experience went. So you can provide a, a review that is specific to your needs and your experiences. If you said your weight was important in your care, we'll ask if the doctor addressed your weight in a compassionate, sensitive, and effective way. If you want a blunt doctor, we'll also ask how blunt was the doctor. We can take that information and update our database of doctors and improve our matching down the road. That also is feedback that we can provide in an anonymized manner to these providers so they can also improve their care in the future. Once we help patients find doctors who are right for them, they're going to be happier. They're more likely to stay with that doctor. They're more likely to listen to that doctor, take their meds, do the preventive care that's necessary, see the doctor regularly. And if something comes up, they're going to feel comfortable calling that primary care provider and taking care of an issue in the bud before it grows up into a large problem that they have to go to the emergency room for and end up with an expensive bill. So overall, we're gonna save patients, insurance companies, and healthcare systems a lot of money by developing these high quality relationships between patients and doctors. We have a few competitors right now, but none of them integrate everything in the same way we do. For example, SteadyMD will ask you these questions about how you like to be treated, but they only have 10 doctors in their list because they don't work with insurance companies. You have to pay an additional fee on top of your insurance to access their treatment. If you look at ZocDoc, they only address medical conditions. So if you have a rash, great. You can find a dermatologist who specializes in that kind of rash, but they won't ask you if you want a blood doctor or not. They don't take care of that. So we put it all together in an integrated way that addresses all of your needs. We are a software as a service offering business to business. So we charge a healthcare system or an insurance company based on a certain volume of patients. We'll charge $20 a patient and then we'll make the service available to all those patients and put that system's physicians into our database. There are 200 million people who have private healthcare insurance in the United States right now 1.6 million of them live in St. Louis, and with an initial deal of 200,000 people charging $20 per patient, we could have $400 million in revenue in the first year, and we can continue expanding afterwards. We're most of the way through our prototyping phase right now. Over the summer, we want to build a minimum of viable product so that in the fall, we can run a pilot study for a year with an initial partner to work out all the details of working in the healthcare system, and then grow regionally and nationally thereafter. Thanks for all your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So our sixth team is Bloodspec. Let me just pull that up real quick. So Bloodspec uh, is also based out of St. Louis, aims to improve quantification of blood loss during childbirth by using a combination of weight and optical spectroscopy sensors that integrate into current OR practices. So this is blood spec. Hi, my name is Casey, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about managing blood loss during childbirth using our device, 
blood speck. We first encountered this problem through observing a C-section birth performed by one of our mentors. Her and her colleagues all expressed concern about the way they estimated blood loss during procedures. As a result, I identified the following need that has driven the creation of our product a way to improve quantifying blood loss during childbirth to decrease associated death and complications. Slow loss of blood over the course of the procedure is the biggest concern here. If there is a slow hemorrhage, blood loss can reach a critical level unknowingly and result in a drop of blood pressure. After this point, the mother is at a higher risk for long-term complications or even death. So maternal hemorrhage leads to around 100,000 deaths worldwide every year. Though this number may not seem that large, consider for a moment the numerous initiatives being pursued to prevent opioid deaths, which only come to about 70% of this number annually. It is also important to note that this is only the statistics for death. Complication rates are even higher. Sadly, little statistics are collected for these values, but in the United States alone, there are 50,000 mothers with long-term complications from hemorrhaging during childbirth every year. Having found statistical support for the concerns expressed by the OBGYNs at Barnes Jewish Hospital, we directed our attention to market size. We believe that our solution would not only be adapted for use during childbirth, but also in other types of surgery, such as trauma. Given that childbirth is a stagnant market, we incorporated expansion into other surgeries when we were doing our business plan. The main incentive for hospitals is the money they could save using our solution. Our product allows for earlier interventions through medications, which are far cheaper than relying on blood transfusions. In this table, we only compare the cost due to complications such as additional corrective actions that must be taken by the hospital and lawsuits. These numbers don't include the costs of a post-operative monitoring time. We estimate that allowing doctors to intervene with these medications rather than rely on blood transfusions could save the hospital several thousands of dollars per procedure, since it would decrease post-operative monitoring times. Our main goal is to provide a quantitative measure for blood loss over the course of the procedure so that action can be taken before the treatment point is reached. Essentially, this is to allow for intervention prior to vital drops, which occur around 1,000 milliliters of blood loss. By slowing or stopping bleeding prior to this point, the mother is less likely to come away from the procedure with long-term complications. Currently, blood loss is visually estimated by doctors since it is collected in multiple locations, including surgical laps and wipes, suction canisters, and drapes. Other companies have made efforts to establish solutions in this space, including Triton and Hemofuse. The Triton system uses weight and or imaging of laps to determine blood loss volume. The solution was actually considered by Barnes for their labor and delivery rooms, but with a price tag of $20,000 per unit per month, they decided against it. Hemofuse, on the other hand, has shown promise as an auto-transfusion method in Ghana and Kenya, specifically can't be used in pregnant women in their third trimester. Methods fall short of our expectations for quantifying blood loss. Visual estimation is looking at total fluid loss, not just blood loss. Triton system is expensive and inefficient since the nurse must pause to hold up surgical laps for imaging. And solutions such as hemofuse aren't scalable to childbirth. This is where our solution is different. By combining a two-part quantification system with a modified suction attachment, we are able to get a more accurate and continuous reading of blood loss. We designed the suction head attachment to allow for wiping, since OBGYNs claim that's the main reason for their use of surgical laps. By using this attachment, the doctor is already minimizing blood that is collected outside of the suction canister, meaning the volume within the canister is already more accurate for realizing total blood loss. There's then an optical spectroscopy sensor inside the canister that determines what percentage of this fluid volume is blood, since the canister will also contain saline and amniotic fluid. We realize that 100% reliance on the suction attachment is unrealistic, which is why our system has a weight sensor that is placed on the racks where most ORs already collect their surgical laps. The final blood loss volume is displayed on the integration device, and once numbers near dangerous levels, an indicator light and an alarm will notify the doctor. Each component of our system is intended to integrate into current practices in the OR to allow for easy adoption. Current tests for our suction attachment, shown at the right, 
using the at-home suction system shown at the bottom left. Surprisingly, we found that our design collected fluid quicker than both of the current collection methods, suction and surgical labs. Based off our benchtop test results, we predict we can decrease the length of the procedure by four to eight minutes or between seven to 17 percent. Not only would this decrease in time help prevent complications, but it would also save the hospital several hundred dollars per procedure. Given the better availability of numbers for the time spent in the OR, we focused our analysis on that, but we expect these trends are predictive of the benefits that would be seen post-procedure. Before closing, I'd like to introduce you to our team. We are a group of four collegiate women and two mentors who are all dedicated to improving women's health around the world. Given our backgrounds in public health and engineering, we were able to come at this problem with a new perspective compared to most doctors. While knowing the personal impact of this problem, we were able to analyze it as a problem of optimization. We have a working prototype for our suction attachment, shown here, and a partial prototype for our two sensor accounting system. Provisional patents were filed on April 28th for both of these designs. As far as the business side of things, we expect to turn a profit of around $12,000 by 2025. And given the extensive cost of establishing a business, we are seeking investors at this time. Looking ahead, we plan to use our connections with Barnes Jewish Hospital and Calocyte, a synthetic blood substitute company, to gain our initial sales. And when the time comes to exit the market, we hope to be acquired by a larger medical device company. Thank you for your time. If you have questions, please email me at the email below. Okay, everybody. So we finally reached our seventh and final team. And I am well aware of the fact that we are just a few minutes away from this event um, being scheduled to close. So it's going to run over by just a few minutes here. After this video, we're going to just um, give a few quick closing announcements and then announce the winners and then we would be off for the night. So thank you everybody for joining us and uh, staying patient with us as we um, go through the presentations. Our final presentation is by a group called IRIS. Um, based out of Texas, we'll be showcasing automatic retina imaging for vision loss prevention. Loss of vision is one of the most traumatic things that anyone can go through. Unfortunately, over half of all diabetics are affected by some kind of vision loss. This condition is known as diabetic retinopathy and is a leading cause of blindness in American adults. To prevent blindness and vision loss, early detection of eye diseases is key. However, people living in rural areas and underserved communities don't receive eye care. At AIRIS, we are solving this problem through the use of a low-cost retina imaging system capable of diagnosing eye diseases in low-resource environments. Specifically, our system uses a machine learning algorithm to classify images of the retina acquired using a smartphone and a lens adapter. There are two main benefits to our system. Firstly, it allows for the diagnosis of eye diseases without the need for any medical professionals. Secondly, we use low-cost hardware, which are ideal for use in low-resource environments. Our mission is to prevent vision loss in vulnerable populations. So far, our team has completed the development of our novel software algorithm capable of accurately detecting various eye diseases with a 97% degree of accuracy on real-world subjects. We are currently in the process of developing the hardware and are seeking support to accomplish our goal of preventing vision loss in vulnerable populations. AIRIS aims to revolutionize ophthalmology by automating retina exams without expensive equipment or the presence of a medical professional. Doing so can prevent vision loss and improve the quality of life of over 4 million individuals suffering from diabetic retinopathy in the U.S. alone and tens of millions worldwide. Our technology is tailor-made for economically disadvantaged areas and will provide aid to those in the greatest need. Our portable imaging system consists of three major components, a machine learning algorithm to classify images of the retina, a smartphone for image acquisition and processing, and a specialized lens that is adapted to work with a smartphone camera. Our mission is to prevent vision loss in vulnerable populations. In particular, we are targeting individuals who suffer from diabetic retinopathy, living in rural areas and underserved communities. Affecting over 30 million diabetics in the United States alone, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in American adults, and this trend is expected to increase as the rate of diabetes grows. Our target population, which consists of diabetics in the U.S. who live in rural and underserved communities, is estimated to be roughly 780,000. 
and 69,000 in Texas alone. The immense diabetes market presents a promising commercial potential for our product, while rural and underserved communities present the strongest use case for our device. Diabetics of all socioeconomic classes need to regularly check their vision to monitor the possibility of diabetic retinopathy. We'll be adopting a B2B model and will generate revenue through direct sales and subscription revenue streams. While our users will be patients who suffer from diabetic retinopathy, our target customers will be small healthcare facilities and health hubs that operate in underserved communities and rural areas. Specifically, we'll be targeting CVS Minute Clinics and Walgreens healthcare clinics around the nation, particularly those in cities with low income populations and rural areas. These CVS and Walgreens health hubs will also serve as our distribution channels. Currently, there are other companies on the market attempting to offer alternatives to the traditional ophthalmoscope, but none of them have the capability to capture an image and provide a diagnosis using the same device. Additionally, our device will cost much less than existing competitors who do not offer products at a price feasible for our target market. AIRIS will be the only device on the market capable of delivering automated diagnosis on a portable, cost-effective, and easy-to-use smartphone platform. There are four key steps that must be taken in order for AIRIS to enter into the next phase of development. These are IP protection, prototype completion, additional testing, and fundraising. We are currently in the process of submitting a provisional patent for our technology and are in the final stages of several grant programs that have the possibility of providing important funding for prototype development and testing. The AIRIS team is dedicated to provide affordable eye care to all and to make an impact in reducing preventable blindness. We thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. If you are interested to hear more, please feel free to contact us. Okay, everybody. So that is our seventh and final team. Uh, as I mentioned before, I know we're just going over a little bit here. So I'll just spend a few minutes with the um, closing remarks as well as the announcement of the winners. So first of all, thank you to our sponsors, uh, judges, and the uh, Sling Health community at large, as well as uh, Venture Cafe, and anybody else who's been able to take some time in their evening tonight to join us uh, for these presentations. Again, because of the COVID situation, uh, everybody had to pivot um, into a virtual alternative, so we were able to make something happen. So thank you for joining us um, this evening. I uh, wanted to also show this UR, a QR code one last time. If you have questions or feedbacks for any of the teams that presented, uh, go ahead and QR this code or go to that link to provide those, um, that feedback or ask those questions. And that pretty much wraps up our event. So the last thing we are going to do are just, uh, announce, is just announce our winners. Uh, we, find, we got our final decisions back from our judges and starting with our third place winner is Bloodspec, who will receive $1,000. In second place is AI Risks, who will receive $2,000. And the overall winner of tonight's event, drum roll, is Eurogix, uh, and they will receive $3,000. So there you have it, everybody. Thank you for joining as well, and congratulations to our three winners. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of us on the National Ex Executive Board. I encourage everybody to follow us continually on our website as we spin up a boot camp that will happen in a few weeks. And if you're interested in working together in the future, um, uh, again, please let us know. Thank you for joining and